Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Digby Ritchie and we continue our series on Brushing Up the Bard, a study of the great works of William Shakespeare. This lecture is going to be devoted to Shakespeare's Macbeth. Macbeth is by far the shortest of Shakespeare's great tragedies. It is estimated that it's only 2,086 lines long. It is a fast-paced, economical, frightening and suspenseful work, immensely popular with readers and audiences alike. Despite the claims that it is an unlucky work and the plethora of theatrical superstitions that cling to the Scottish play, Macbeth has certainly been presented in a number of legendary productions throughout the centuries. Apparently, in the 18th century, the pre-eminent actor David Garrick scored an enormous success as Macbeth, even though he used an anachronistic powdered wig, fashionable at the time, in his performance. The 18th century female mega star Sarah Siddons scored an even greater triumph as Lady Macbeth. Apparently, she observed sleepwalkers in order to prepare for the famous sleepwalking scene, and she gave a performance that was so frightening and so poignant that during a presentation in Glasgow, one audience member cried out, oh, she's a fallen angel. In the 20th century, in 1953, Laurence Olivier presented his Macbeth. It was his second performance in the role, and many critics believed that his tormented, self-disgusted Thane was the definitive performance in the role. In that same production, Olivia's then wife, the exquisite Vivian Lee, shattered the stereotype of Lady Macbeth as a hectoring battle axe and played her rather as a beautiful, manipulative seductress. This innovative performance met with some strange, if memorable, criticism. The critic of The Observer, Kenneth Tynan, commented disapprovingly that Lee's Lady Macbeth was more viper than anaconda. It seems very strange to us that Lady Macbeth should be perceived necessarily as an obviously crushing, throttling anaconda more than the subtly poisonous viper. I remember from the 1970s, from 1976, Trevor Nunn's magnificent Royal Shakespeare Company production. Nunn said that he was going to emphasise the intimate horror of the play, and he certainly succeeded in his intention. The youthful Ian McKellen's Macbeth, with his concave cheeks and anguished eyes, presented a man that was filled with internal conflicts and terrors, and Judy Dench truly inspired both pity and terror in the sleepwalking scene. Kenneth Branagh, for me a consistently marvellous Shakespearean actor and a very memorable and moving Hamlet, was a rugged and very martial Macbeth, but interestingly gentle and restrained in the presentation of the Thane's despair. His rendition of the Tomorrow speech was unforgettably sad because of its lack of overemphasis. Yet, for all that Macbeth is, after Hamlet, probably the best known and most widely quoted of Shakespeare's tragedies, it has sometimes been ill-served by its admirers as well as its detractors. Lovers of the play tend to oversimplify it by presenting it as a kind of moralising, crime-does-not-pay text in which excessive ambition is roundly and deservedly punished. The Aristotelian tragic flaw argument is too neatly, even rigidly, imposed on Shakespeare's very complex drama. Aristotle's exploration of tragedy as an art form in which the downfall of a great heroic figure through a tragic flaw, which could be an inherent fault 
or an error is a useful way of examining tragedy, but it should not be too worshipfully accepted. Many people claim that Macbeth makes absolutely clear the problem. He himself speaks of his vaulting ambition. But this too is a simplification. After all, ambition can be linked to virtue. There is such a force as an honest desire for self-advancement within humanity. At the beginning of Macbeth, Macbeth's ambition to be a mighty and acclaimed warrior is certainly realized, but this ambition is linked to virtue. Macbeth is, after all, defending Duncan's throne from external invasion and internal treachery. His ambition serves a virtuous cause. Rather, the greatness of Macbeth, or so it seems to me, stems from its profound and profoundly exciting exploration of the duality within all human beings. For Shakespeare, Evil is always a matter of personal choice, and good actions are the result of a victory over the evil within us all, for we are all fallen beings. Philosophers have discussed this duality of humanity throughout the ages, whether Christian philosophers like St. Augustine speaking of the taint of original sin or Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, who spoke of Thanatos, that attraction to destruction, appetite, evil, the primal within all of us. Or even the great novelist William Golding, who in his superb dystopian work, Lord of the Flies, speaks of evil as a kind of inherent disease within humanity, or as he puts it, man's essential illness. Human beings have always been fascinated by this conflict within all of us, because few of us are sentimental enough or simplistic enough to believe that all people are born inherently and absolutely good. Shakespeare certainly examines the external temptations that lure a human being towards evil, but he insists that individual choice is paramount. Some strange and typically malevolent comments of the witches leap to mind here. Those of you who've read the text will of course remember the torments they plan to inflict upon the unfortunate sea captain because his wife refused to share chestnuts with one of them. Interestingly, though, they say that his bark, and bark here means not just his ship, but also his being as a man, can be tempest-tossed, but it cannot be entirely lost. This is a very important point indeed. External agents can tempt one to commit evil. They cannot force one to do so. The witches can cause great suffering. They can inflict huge pain on the sea captain, but they cannot cause him to be entirely lost, which means damned, spiritually lost, condemned to hellfire, unless he himself allows them to tempt him that far. And it's a very, very important point to apply to Macbeth himself. It may seem a little strange to leap now to another Shakespearean text, but let me remind you of a very famous passage from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, in which the herbalist philosopher Friar, Friar Lawrence, speaks of the opposing kings, the forces in conflict, within all human beings. He refers to those forces as grace, that's God-given reason, rationality and morality, and rude will, passion,
commitment to one's own desires and appetites. For me, the true greatness of Macbeth stems from the fact that Shakespeare offers us the most profoundly probing exploration of the conflict between grace and rude will within an extraordinary and tragic individual. Because Macbeth is not simply a great hero, a mighty warrior. He is also a highly imaginative man with an intense awareness of exactly what constitutes goodness and evil. Therein lies the tragedy. In Act One, we are introduced to the three witches, the weird sisters who are embodiments of the mysterious tempting powers of evil. They are associated from the outset with moral confusion, darkness, obscurity. They enter during a time of turmoil in nature, thunder and lightning, and also turmoil amidst human beings, battle. And they await the end of the hurly-burly when the battles lost and won. Their words constantly remind the reader or the viewer that there will always be triumph and suffering in human existence. Battles will be lost by some, won by others. And life is always a combination of the fair and the foul. But the witches are dedicated to moral inversion to making morality uncertain, to turning beliefs upside down. They practice equivocation, a very important term in the context of Macbeth. To equivocate means to speak ambiguously, to use half-truths in order to deceive and confuse people. And the witches are mistresses of this very deceptive art. After the initial short appearance of the three witches, we are plunged into battle. The bloody man, the wounded sergeant, gives a graphic account of the conflict that is raging, still raging, between the forces of Duncan and a combined army of invaders, foreign invaders, and homegrown traitors. The sergeant's loyalty and courage are emphasised. He has fought to prevent the capture of Malcolm, King Duncan's eldest son. But perhaps most significant is the fact that he introduces us to Macbeth. He expresses overawed admiration for the remarkable bravery and military prowess of Macbeth. Macbeth is described as an eagle and a lion in battle, and the bloody execution that he has inflicted upon the traitors, the enemies of the rightful king, is proudly emphasised. The imagery that clings to Macbeth in the early stages of the play is imagery of almost superhuman courage. He is Valor's minion the beloved of valour, courage personified. And he is most memorably Bologna's bridegroom, the husband of the mythological goddess of war. Of course, the godlike warrior status of Macbeth is potentially dangerous. But it is important to note that at this point, it is linked to a virtuous cause. I think it is a mistake to claim, as some critics have, that Shakespeare worships authority in Macbeth, kingly authority. That is not the case. The authority that Shakespeare celebrates in Macbeth is virtuous authority. As I shall be emphasising in later lectures, the play is about politics and power as well, and it is exploring what constitutes just good government. Duncan in the play is a just and good man. His generosity and compassion are revealed from the outset. He 
he calls for surgeons for the wounded sergeant. And he also insists that he will reward Macbeth as soon as possible. Noble Macbeth will be given the title of Thane of Cawdor that once belonged to that very treacherous nobleman. Duncan's generosity of spirit, his graciousness, his lack of corruption are all major qualities in a righteous ruler. And one of the saddest ironies, one of the most terrible ironies in Macbeth is the fact that nobody is more aware of the greatness and goodness of Duncan than Macbeth himself. The regicide fully appreciates the grandeur and the goodness of the king. When Macbeth murders Duncan and usurps power, he, Macbeth, overthrows just authority and entrenches tyranny. And that is an important part of this tragedy too. In their prophecies to Macbeth and to Banquo, the witches show their skill in the equivocation that I've already defined. They greet Macbeth as Thane of Glams, simply a fact that is his inherited title. Then they greet him as Thane of Cawdor, a prediction. And finally they state that he shall be king hereafter. The last statement is not so much a prophecy as an incitement. They are saying you shall be king in the future. But the suggestion is, of course, if you are prepared to act in your own interests. Their prophecies to Banquo are more intricate and more deliberately confusing. It appears that Banquo will be greater than Macbeth, but also lesser. He will not be king himself, and yet his descendants will be kings, and he will be happier than Macbeth. The equivocation, of course, suggests that there are times in which success will be accompanied by misery and suffering, and that what might be defined as great by one is not truly great in the eyes of another. Macbeth's response to the witches' prophecies is very important indeed, and Banquo expresses amazement at his friend's response. He says, good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? Why indeed? Why does Macbeth start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? The key point, of course, is he is frightened by this revelation. The witches have brought to light the hidden desires of his innermost being. The lust for power has always been there, concealed, and he is ashamed of it. And thus he is frightened when it is openly, openly mentioned by the witches. What Macbeth himself calls his black and deep desires have long been part of his being. And that is what is truly terrifying about Macbeth's response to the witch's prophecies. He fears what is already within himself. So far, I've looked at the history of Macbeth in production and the philosophical issues at the heart of this extraordinary play. I've also analysed the first power of temptation, the power of the witches in the play. In subsequent lectures, I shall look in more detail at Macbeth's responses to his choice of evil. I shall consider Lady Macbeth's role, very important indeed, and also look at the political dimension of this extraordinary text. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope to talk to you all again in the near future.